So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the virtual gold conference and our very first keynote speaker. He is Mr. James Rickards. James and I have known each other for quite a while. He's a counselor, he's an investment banker. He's had over 40 years experience in capital markets. Not only that, he has written a number of books and I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, they are something that if you have not already, you should read them. I've got one here at the moment. It's called Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. And Jim wrote this quite some time ago, most of which is very prescient for what's going on today. And we'll talk a little bit about this book, but we're also going to talk a little bit, uh, James, about your coming book, which is called The New Great Depression, which sounds very depressing, but we'll <laughs> get into that as well. Sadly, ladies and gentlemen, I, I actually hope to have read it because I do, Jim, I have every single one of your books, The New Case for Gold, Aftermath, Currency Wars. If you haven't already, ladies and gentlemen, go check them out, order them because it will help you in your investing journey. And the reason that I've got Mr. Rickards on as our opening keynote speaker for this, the second virtual gold conference is we are living in very volatile times. We are living in times when we must understand precious metals. And I also want to talk to you, Jim, about why you have written this book, The New Great Depression. You say that we're in a new great depression, but a lot of uh, the data coming out, the stock markets are on fire, uh, real assets are going up, everything's at all time highs. How do you reconcile your negative views with a stock market mania and everyone saying, I mean, here in Australia, property markets going up, real assets are going up. I'd really love to know why you are talking about a new Great Depression. Great. Well, that's a great question, Kerry. We'll get to that. But first of all, uh, thank you for the uh, for the introduction and the kind words about the books. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and your audience. I know uh, there are participants from all over the world, but it's, it's uh, got a great uh, Australian home and Australian base. And uh, my only regret is I can't be in Australia. I've, I've been there many times. My first visit was in uh, uh, 1981. Uh, I've been back many times since uh, all over the country, of course, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, but also uh, uh, Brisbane and uh, even been to uh, to Alice. I uh, met a lot of Australians who haven't been to Alice. So I've driven hundreds of miles through the outback by myself. So I love the but country. You, and again, but you also sorry. spoke, I think <clears throat> you spoke at the ABC Bullion Conference. And I just want to say ABC Bullion are, are sponsoring our, our conference today. So my thanks to them as well. You spoke, I think it was last year at their conference. That, that's right. It was a, and a, a Janie and uh, her group there are, are fabulous. Uh, so that was a, uh, that was a, that was a huge audience. That was my last physical trip to Australia. We had a large live audience. And then of course the pandemic hit after that and uh, the travel restrictions are around the world. We're suffering them in the U S but I know uh, they've had severe lockdowns in Australia and I have quite a few friends in, in Melbourne. So I'm quite uh, familiar with what's going on in Victoria. So, uh, but it's affecting the whole country in Sydney as well. So uh, we, we certainly uh, sympathize with uh, your uh, challenges and uh, assure you we have them, uh, we have them here as well. So with that, that said, uh, it's, it's just great to be with you in uh, the symposium and um, a virtual gold conference and, uh, and, and with your audience. So let's kind of uh, jump in. By the way, I was glad, glad to see you had Currency Wars. That was my first book. It's almost 10 years old. Uh, yeah. And it's funny, there are a lot of great economists. Uh, I'm pretty critical of economists, but there's some good ones out there. And even the ones I disagree with, you can kind of respect what they're doing. But uh, economists don't write a lot of books. They prefer to write uh, papers, uh, journal articles and so forth. And, and the reason for that is um, the subject matter is very ephemeral, um, you know, curves change, data changes, et cetera. So well, why write a book, you know, just put out a paper and then if things change, I'll write another paper. Uh, there are some exceptions, but there, there aren't too many books on economics and very few that are still selling well 10 years after they were written, but Currency Wars, I'm glad to say, uh, uh, is still uh, still selling very well, has a, has a following. So uh, but it, it's part part of my approach is to, uh, yeah, you want to talk about things that are topical at the time the book comes out, but you can put it in a context where you have analysis and explanation that has a much longer shelf life. And, you know, I, I, as an author, you know, I hope a uh, hundred years from now when people are trying to figure out what the heck was going on in the 
early uh, 2000s, <laughs> my books will be out there. I tell people, you know, 50 years from now, we'll all be dead, but the, the, the books will still be out there and uh, hopefully they'll have that, um, that, that kind of shelf life. But uh, yeah, and my other book that you mentioned, I've had uh, five altogether, new one coming out, but um, Aftermath, uh, and that, that's done very well in Australia as well as around the world. But if you, if you go to Aftermath and turn to pages 285 to 295, you know, toward the end, um, now that book came out in July, 2019. Mm -hmm. So over a year ago, well over a year ago. And what do I talk about in those 10 pages? I mentioned uh, pandemics. Mm -hmm. I say there will be a pandemic or at least two other things, a war or a, a, another natural disaster type events, but I include pandemics among three events. I said, there's a 100% chance that one of them will happen in the next three years it turned out to be the pandemic. I talked about social unrest, armed gangs in the streets. Uh, of course, but that's exactly what we're seeing in the United States uh, and other things. So if you, if you read that uh, in the summer of 2019, there was nothing that happened this year in 2020 that you weren't prepared for, at least didn't get some warning. Uh, and my new book, uh, the, the New Great Depression, uh, and, we'll, and we'll turn to that now. It comes out um, in January, so you know, just a, a, about a month away, a little over a month away. Um, and that tells you what's going to happen next year and the year after. So I try to just, you know, when, when you're hunting, you don't aim at the target, you, you lead the target. And so I try to lead um, the, the forecast and help people see what's coming. So that's what the, uh, that's what the new book will do. I do have a reputation for nice cheery titles. We have uh, Currency Wars, The Death of Money, uh, uh, The Road to Ruin, Aftermath, and the new book, The New Great Depression. So uh, I'm, I'm personally very, I'm a very optimistic, upbeat kind of person, but I also don't believe in sugarcoating things. I don't, I don't consider myself a pessimist. I consider myself a realist. And so- just, if, Yeah, uh, you're a realist, Jim, and you always have been. And I think that that's what people need to understand that you aren't being a pessimist, you're just trying to open people's minds. And I think that's the reason we're doing this conference today. I want people to get educated. I want them to understand and to stop the blinkers. That, so, that's right. That's, that's, that's what I try to do, but also in a way that uh, not only looks forward and, and kind of tells you what's gonna happen next. And uh, there are definitely challenges. There may be very difficult economic, economic times, but I also make the point that you can certainly preserve wealth and better than that, you can actually make a lot of money uh, if you get the forecast right and uh, if you take appropriate action in time. Now, the forecasting is the hard part, but, uh, but we've, we have a good model for that. Uh, but if you get that right, then there are things you can do. I point out in, uh, in the 19, in the, in the Weimar hyperinflation of the early 1920s, 1922, 23 was the worst of it. And, and most, Certainly anyone interested in gold knows all about the Weimar hyperinflation because that's, uh, uh, that's a, a classic case of, of paper money or fiat money becoming essentially worthless. It was, wasn't even tendered at the end. It was swept down sewers. Um, and there are other cases like that, but that's one of the most famous, particularly because Germany was such a highly developed economy at the time. But there was an individual whose name was Hugo Stinnes, and he went out in 1921. He borrowed enormous amounts of money. He borrowed the Reichsmarks. He bought uh, ships. He bought coal. He bought steel. He bought mines. He bought steel mills, all hard assets. Uh, I dare say some gold, but these were industrial assets. Uh, then the hyperinflation hit. He paid back all his debts to the penny in basically worthless money. He said, well, here's, your Reich, here's the Reichsmarks I owe you, by the way. They're worthless, but here they are. Paid off all his debts, kept the hard assets, and became the richest man in Germany. Uh, and his nickname, uh, my, my German is poor, but I'll say inflation chronic, which means the inflation king. So there's an individual who saw it coming, took the right steps and ended up as the richest man in Germany in or as a result of the worst type of inflation practically in history. Another example, one of my personal favorites, Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of uh, our president, John Kennedy, uh, was um, he, he had a, a, lot, a lot of things going on, but throughout the 1920s, he was involved in ramps. So he had, he had a gang, uh, uh, Mike May, big Mike May, and they called him and Joseph Kennedy, you know, they ramped the stocks, let the suckers buy them. And, and then, um, you know, they would tank and he'd keep all the money. But prior to October, 1929, which when we had, when we had our stock market crash, he went out and, uh, and shorted stocks and made a fortune and became one of, not the, but one of the richest, uh, people in America 
as a result of correctly anticipating the stock market crash of 1929. So my point is, um, even in the face of a very dire forecast and the worst of circumstances, you can at least preserve wealth and possibly make a lot of money if you see it coming. So it's no time to throw up your hands. It's no time to be, I'm not a doom and gloomer, but I am a realist and we can see certain things coming, but there's a lot investors can do. And that's what we talk about in the book. Uh, so to your specific question, Kerry, which is, yes. Uh, so from in March and April, uh, but mostly, sorry, mostly uh, February, March, really, mostly in March, we had a historic stock market crash, uh, at least U major, US major indices, but it's true around the world, fell over 30%. Our unemployment went to almost 15%. Um, in the second quarter of 2020, we had the, the worst annualized quarterly performance in US history. Again, it was the same all over the world. I don't have to go country by country, but most familiar with the US uh, uh, numbers and our economy fell 31% on an annualized basis in the second quarter. From that bottom, uh, and you can date it, it was March 23rd, uh, stocks have regained all of their losses. They've hit new all-time highs uh, recently. Um, well, they, they, um, the, well, actually, they're all, as of today, they're all into new, new all-time highs. They, they had a little peak September 2nd, and then went down again, but now they're, now they're back. Um, unemployment has come down, it's still too high, but it has come down, uh, and growth in the third quarter uh, on an annualized basis was 33%. So, uh, which was the, the highest growth of any single quarter in US history. So you had this you know, sharp leg down, a very strong leg back, stocks are back where they were, unemployment is coming down. So is it all good? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, and, and I'll explain why. First of all, it's important to distinguish between a recession and a depression. Uh, recession is uh, a technical term. It's uh, roughly defined as two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Uh, Australia's just had its first technical recession in, I believe, 26 years. A long, nice winning streak, nice going uh, Australia. Um, the U.S. has them more frequently, but um, uh, two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Now, we had that. In the first quarter, it was down 5%. Second quarter, down 33%, uh, sorry, 31% on an annualized basis. So there are your two quarters back to back. Uh, our National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the uh, uh, unofficial but uh, universally regarded referee, said that a recession began in February 2020. And I think that's exactly right. I think that, that they called that right. Um, that recession is over. Uh, we had strong growth in the th third quarter, as I described. Fourth quarter is not spectacular, but it looks like it's going to grow around three to 4%, uh, which is uh, okay by the old standard, not so great g given where we're coming from. But uh, so the recession's over, but the depression has just begun. And people say, well, wait a second, uh, if a recession is two quarters of declining GDP, surely a depression must be something like 10 quarters of declining GDP. You've already said that we had growth in the third quarter. How can we be in a depression? The answer is that's not the definition of a depression. A depression, I use John Maynard Keynes definition uh, from uh, uh, a, a book he wrote in the 1930s. Um, he said that um, his definition was, it's a sustained period of below trend growth with neither a, neither a tendency to return to normal nor to collapse. So in other words, depression is depressed growth. It doesn't mean that the economy has to decline continually. It means that the economy is growing at a depressed rate relative to historic trend. Since 1980, and that's a pretty favorable period, uh, recoveries in the US have averaged 3.2% growth. In the period, that's, a, that's a, I guess a pretty good period. If we go back to World War II, our recoveries have averaged closer to 4% growth. But just to take the post-1980 trend, 3.2% growth. In the so-called recovery from June 2009 to December 2019, just prior to the most recent recession, growth was 2.2%. And I call that a depression because if your trend is 3.2 and you're growing at 2.2, okay, you have growth. But one percentage point compounded over 10 years, it doesn't sound like a lot. It, it leaves $5 trillion of wealth on the table. In other words, if you had grown at 3.2 versus the 2.2, they're both growth, but the depressed growth reduced uh, uh, GDP by $5 trillion. That's how much you leave on the table 
with 1% applied to, you know, $22 trillion economy. Um, we're back in that mode. Uh, so let's just kind of disaggregate the numbers a little bit. So you say, well, gee, if we went down 31% in the second quarter and came up 33% in the third quarter, aren't we back where we started? And the answer is no. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's a role for calculus in economics, but sometimes fifth grade math does just fine. And what happens is if you, if you normalize it 100, just say call it 100% of uh, output, 100% of output, so you say 100, you take it down 31%, you get to 69. But when you apply the 33%, you're not applying it to the 100, you're applying it to the 69 to because you're on a new base. So 33% of 69 is, um, I get to do the, it's about 24, 25, but the point is it gets you back up in the high 80s. Um, it doesn't get you back to 100, even though the number's bigger because you're working from a much smaller base. So that only gets you to like you know, about 89, 90% of prior output. Now we have 3% out, uh, 3 growth, let's say in the fourth quarter. That's nice, now you're back to 93. Guess what, you're still not back to 100. We're not going to get to 2019 levels of output until 2023 at the earliest. That's if a lot of things go well. Uh, we have near record growth in 2021, which I, we won't, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but, uh, but if everything goes well, we will not get to 2019 levels of output until 2023. We will not get to 2019 levels of employment or low unemployment until 2025. This is a multi-year um, slog out of what we got into in the second quarter. One way to think about it, Kerry, is you fell into a 50-foot hole, you climbed out 20 feet, nice job, but you're still 30 feet below where you started. And that's that's where we are best case. Now, why? and that's, that's a depression. That's what a depression is, that sustained weak growth, um, not enough to get you anywhere near to the, to the prior trend. Leave alone the fact that growth going forward may be, in fact, my view likely will be worse than the 2.2% growth uh, that I just criticized a minute ago from 2009 to 2019. That 2.2% growth, which was below the long-term trend, we'll be lucky to get that. We might be looking, if we have growth at all, we might be looking at 1.75, 1.8%. So again, you're back into Keynes' definition, which is, yeah, there's growth, uh, that's good, but uh, it's be well below the trend. Meanwhile, what's happening to your debt? The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. And I'm not even counting fiscal 2020, which is finished. We, we had, the U.S. had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre-pandemic. The Congress threw three trillion dollars of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled three trillion dollars on top. Uh, now um, we can talk about politics later. Uh, our election's not over. A lot of people think it is, but uh, there's there's some debate about that. But leaving that aside, I can spare our our global audience, the U.S. civics class. But uh, but assuming Joe Biden does is sworn in as president on January 20th, um, they're looking at uh, I mean they're looking at policies. At, well, at that point, you'll have a Democratic Speaker of the House with a bare majority, but still a majority, and a Democratic president. They'll get back to this bill that they never quite finished before our election day that would add perhaps 2 trillion on top of what I just said, plus the 1 trillion baseline deficit that never went away. So look for 3 trillion more. Now, this is gonna take the US debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. When you walk into the high school cafeteria, who's sitting at that table with you? It's Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. That's the US peer group. Even uh, Americans love to criticize Europe. Uh, even France and Spain are in much better shape than the United States. They're, they're 
over 100%. Germany is closer to 60%. The US is 135%. Now the outlier is Japan, which is you know, 250%. Yeah, but that's, that's been a basket case for, for, for decades, as we know. But Jim, what I want to ask you is, does it matter in these days of what I call funny money printing? The printing presses are going crazy. That fiat currency is being printed into oblivion. It's going to continue government spending uh, across the globe, because it's not just in the US, it's happening here in Australia, it's happening globally. Uh, right. Does not doesn't that indicate that this this sharp upward growth? You know, I'm seeing it this way, and I'd love you to share it with all of our listeners. Um, don't you feel that because of that, it's different this time? I know that's a that's an old saying, but yep. I, I, it I, is I, different this time because they literally are. They don't care about the debt. They care about creating money out of thin air creating infrastructure and jobs and papering over, excuse the pun, papering over the cracks in the economy. So it will never be seen. But, well, well, if you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Uh, this This comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong, but it's it's got its followers, and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected um, was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. That's the uh, calling them socialist uh, is putting it kindly. Bernie Sanders is a guy who honeymooned in Moscow when it was still the Soviet Union. Uh, and so they're closer to communists, but uh, but we'll just call them socialists to be uh, to be nice, to be polite. Um, well, Biden, who isn't all there, he had to, uh, in exchange for the Bernie Sanders group supporting him and voting for him and not staying home, which they did, by the way, in 2016, uh, and Hillary, you can take it up with Hillary, but uh, um, in order to do that, Biden had to adopt the Bernie Sanders platform, and they did. You can go to the you can go to the Joe Biden website and look at his hundreds of pages of policy. Nobody does this, but you can. It's there, uh, and they took large chunks from the Bernie Sanders primary fight website and just moved them over and changed the name. So Bernie Sanders' top economic advisor, a very nice lady, uh, I know her. Her name is Stephanie Kelton. She's a full professor at the uh, State University of New York in Stony Brook, uh, and she is the big brain behind modern monetary theory. There are a couple others, Randall, uh, Randall Ray and a few others. Uh, Paul McCauley of PIMCO fame uh, is an advocate. Warren Mosler, very famous hedge fund manager. So they have their, their intellectual um, club, if you will. But she's the bright light. And she has, by the way, she has a new book out uh, on this. Um, and sh they take the view that, uh, that the way you, uh, that if the treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? Now, that's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they, they um, build aircraft. They have uh, benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the Treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That that's the, the real source of money. They also take the Treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. Yeah. The treasury is just part of the executive branch uh, and the Fed is an independent agency. 
uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, that a lot of people know. Some people know that. Some people don't. But the the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate. But but the theorists ignore that and say no. Um, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing, and if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine, but if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? And who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2, or sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. Is that going, of, sorry, Jim, to interrupt you. Is that going to go ahead, the forgiveness of student loans? Because that, that's massive. It is massive and it is going ahead. Again, this is all assuming Biden gets sworn in. Uh, but his policies will be carried forward by acting President Harris uh, starting this next summer. Uh, Biden, um, and I say this with uh, sadness, um, Biden is seriously cognitively impaired. I'm not a physician. I haven't, I'm, well, if I were a physician, I haven't examined him and I'm not a physician, but um, I can use some common sense. I've spoken to people who are experts. Um, and uh, Biden was a, a straw man, if you will, to 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 win the election. Um, he'll be uh, he could be removed from office as early as next summer under our 25th Amendment. If the president is not able to carry out his duties, there's a process for that. More likely, some group will go to him uh, and say, look, Mr. President, you're going to be removed. Um, but we'll, if you prefer, you can just resign with dignity. Uh, lead the rest of your life. and But either way, uh, if, if he's removed on the 25th Amendment, Harris becomes acting president. Uh, if he chooses to resign, she becomes the president. But this will happen by, um, by late summer 2021. So you don't even think about Biden's policies because he's not all there. Uh, his, to the extent they've been published, they are Bernie Sanders policies. You can be sure uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris rather, will carry them out. And Stephanie Kelton is waiting in the wings, and she's the big brain of modern monetary theory. So you, this is this is this is what I say about the new book. Uh, you, it's all there, and you can see this coming. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it. But uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now let me just take a minute to explain why, explain that. I should say Reinhardt Rogoff, uh, alphabetical. Uh, Carmen Reinhardt uh, was a full professor at Harvard University. She's now the chief economist of the World Bank. Uh, Ken Rogoff is a full professor at uh, Harvard, both in the economics department. They are co-authors of the book. Uh, it's different this time. You, you kind of mentioned that, that expression. Uh, of course, the joke is it's not, but uh, it's, a good, it's a good line on, on Wall Street. But they've also authored uh, scores of papers looking at specifically at debt to GDP ratios. They've done it over centuries. They've done shorter periods. They've done just emerging markets, just developed markets, all markets, markets group by continents. They've done it every which way, no matter how they do it, they come back to the same conclusion. And this is borne out by empirical data. This is not some uh, wild theory like modern monetary theory. And the, and the point is that up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier, if you want to call it that, greater than one. So the classic example, this is what John Maynard Keynes faced in his lifetime. So in, in the late 1920s, the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They had been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. And um, uh, Keynes said, well, people aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay down debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP, uh, 
Now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental, or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. And by the way, Keynes, um, I separate Keynes and Keynesianism. Keynesianism is a botched, messed up theory invented by Paul Samuelson and the faculty at MIT in the 1950s. Keynes was dead. The real John Maynard Keynes was a pragmatist um, and he knew what worked and he was right. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra, GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt, and this is why Angela Merkel is so adamant about the 60%, you know, because you get, you, get you get a lot of bang for the buck at 30%. You get some, but less bang for the buck at 60%. What and that's why 60% is in the Maastricht Treaty for the and this is what Angela Merkel is so adamant about. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, etc. So now not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt, and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one, on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll give it. I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what? But what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right. The more you borrow, it's actually a headwind of growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. So, um, so what but that means that is scenario, sorry to interrupt you, Jim, but in that scenario, going back to what you said earlier, uh, with the the the, the German uh, the king that bought all the real assets, isn't that potentially if these modern monetary theorists just keep printing the funny money into oblivion, the potential for inflation is there, and the potential for real assets to potentially get out of control is there. So would you recommend that people start to look at hard assets, real assets, such as property and gold and other things as a way to protect their wealth or? Well, I, I've, yeah, the answer, short answer is yes. I've long recommended 10% uh, of your investable assets in gold, um, physical gold, or if you want to kind of go beyond that gold mining shares, uh, et cetera. And then, you know, people look at me funny and they go, Jim, how could you put, you know, 10% of your net worth into gold? And, uh, 
they're 90% in stocks. So they're like, they say to me, how can you sleep at night? I was like, how can you sleep at night? You're 90% in stocks. They can lose 30% in a day. Yeah. Are you comfortable with that? But, but you can't, you know, Wall Street's got everybody so brainwashed about, you know, stocks, stocks for the long run, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, I, I've, uh, I'm happy to write about it, Carrie. I'm happy to talk about it in interviews like this and I'll share my views with people. But um, I'm not a salesman. You know, if you buy gold or don't buy gold, it's, it's yeah. all the same to me. But I certainly recommend it. And whether you're like our friend Hugo Stinnes, who bought uh, coal and steel and, and vessels, or you buy real estate, or you buy gold, which you should have some. And I also recommend a large you know, slug of cash. Um, cash does not have a high return, except in deflation, when it actually, oh. the value of cash goes up. In, in a real deflationary environment, cash can be your best performing asset because it, uh, the, the nominal value remains constant and the real value goes up. Uh, but um, just but to kind of sorry, sorry. So are we at deflation, inflation, stagflation? A lot of we're we're, we're in danger. We're in danger of serious deflation. Now let me, but let me come back to your point, Carrie, because it was an important one about geo. If you're printing all this money, aren't you going to get inflation? I explained why the uh, why John Maynard Keynes and Reinhard Rogoff had it right. The neo Keynesians have it wrong. Uh, the modern monetary theorists have it wrong. Uh, in terms of getting growth from debt, you don't. The, the debt is a headwind to growth at this level. But what about your point, which is, gee, doesn't all this money cause money printing cause inflation? The answer is no. Uh, that's where Milton Friedman was wrong, and the monetarists are wrong, and the Austrians are wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. Money supply does not cause inflation. What does cause inflation is the velocity of money. It's the turnover of money. Oh. So the the quantity theory of money is a very simple equation. Again, six, uh, I, I like to stick to sixth grade math. It's MV equals PQ. M is the money supply. V is velocity or the turnover of money. P is the price index and Q is real GDP. So you multiply real GDP by the price index, you get nominal GDP. So the shorthand is money supply times the turnover of money equals nominal GDP. Really simple, it's an identity. So people, and, and this is Friedman's mistake. He did a lot of things right, but he got this one wrong. He assumed that velocity was constant, just didn't change much. And in most of his lifetime, that was true. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, even into the 80s, that that, that was the, the main body of his career, velocity was pretty constant. And so he said, okay, there's a ceiling on real GDP. In the mature economy, you can only grow you know, three and a half percent, four percent in a good year maybe more if you're coming out of recession, but there's kind of a, a ceiling on, on growth in a developed economy. Uh, and he was right about that. It's, you know, maybe, maybe four, four percent, let's say is potential. Any growth in excess of that is inflationary because if you're, if you can have nominal growth, you can have nominal growth. that's three times that, but it's, you know, four points of real growth and eight points of inflation. But, uh, but real growth is capped around three and a half, four, any growth beyond that is inflationary, which we don't want. Uh, so coming over to the other side of the equation, he assumed velocity is constant. So he said, well, this is easy. If we want P to be one, because we want no inflation or deflation, so price index is you know one. And if real growth is capped at about three and a half, four percent and velocity is constant, all we have to do is dial up the money supply or dial it down like a thermostat and to get maximum real GDP, with no inflation and that's nirvana and he used to joke that we don't need a central bank we just need a computer that can do what i just described um so what did friedman get wrong what he got wrong is that velocity is not constant velocity has been sinking like a stone and this happened in the 1930s this is not the first time get a chart of velocity go to the federal reserve bank of st louis they have a system called fred it's the federal reserve i don't know something but it's it's got 10 million charts in it. they're all free and look up velocity and pick your money supply, you know, M, M1, M2, et cetera. Velocity has fallen off a cliff beginning in 1998, by the way. This is not a- Is it, that it right? Because Sorry to interrupt you, Jim. I would have thought that we're talking about this velocity of money as a result of the pandemic. But you're saying since 1998, velocity has been going down. 
Correct. Now it took a sharp leg down in 2008 in the, in the great finan- the global financial crisis, yeah. took another sharp leg down in 2020 in the pandemic, but the trend has been consistently down since 1998, 22 years of declining velocity. Now I'll, I'll give you a, a simple math problem, Carrie, and I'm not going to wait long for the answer because I know you'll do this off the top of your head. What's $7 trillion times zero? Zero. Correct. In other words, the money supply doesn't matter. The Fed took the money supply to seven trillion, but if your velocity is zero, your economy is zero. You don't have an economy. So the key is velocity. So you can understand monetary policy of the last, uh, oh well, um, you know, twelve years uh, going back before the well, yeah, twelve years. So you go back to the last recession as a desperate race between increasing money supply and decreasing velocity. There was all the money printing has been barely enough to keep up with the collapse of velocity and velocity is still going down. And like I say, if it hits zero, you can have, see now if you you got $10 trillion, 10 trillion, you know, I'll make it simpler, 10 trillion times one is 10 trillion. That would cut the US economy in half. So in other words, our problem is velocity, not money supply. Now, um, so how do you change velocity? That's your, printing money is easy. Uh, the Fed can stick the landing in base money. They can get to two decimal places. How do you change velocity? Velocity is psychological. It's not something that, um, uh, you know, it depends how we feel. Like if I, we, if we feel great, you know, hey, lots of money rolling in, jobs are good. Uh, going out to the restaurant, you know, dinner's on me, drinks for everybody at the bar, it's all on me. That's one state of the world. Um, but if I stay home and watch TV, my money velocity is zero. My money's just sitting in the bank. I'm not spending it. So um, that was true before the pandemic. What do you think happened in, in, in the lockdown? Massive fear. Velocity, massive fear, but, but nobody spent any money. Yeah. Uh, I, was sitting, I was sitting here you know, up in the mountains in the, in the, um, during the worst part of the quarantine, just say in April and May, I was actually trying to think of ways to spend money. I couldn't do it. I mean, it was like, I would go on Amazon or whatever, but, but seriously. Um, so the problem is velocity. The Fed has actually stopped printing money uh, because they know it doesn't work. So just to sum up, monetary policy is impotent because of declining velocity, which is psychological and the Fed can't change it. Fiscal policy is impotent because we're past the 90% threshold in debt to equity. So you can spend all you want, but you're not going to get the growth. The debt actually becomes a headwind to growth. So you cannot get out of this with monetary policy. You cannot get out of it with fiscal policy. And just to make it a little bit worse, we're probably in a in a, in a what's called a double dip recession. I said that the recession was over last July, which it was. And we had growth in the third and looks like a little bit of growth for the fourth quarter, which is true. But we're probably going to be back in recession starting about now, certainly in, in January. And the reason is we're going to do another lockdown. This is Biden's state of policy. Now, I know there's a vaccine out there. That's wonderful. That's great. And the, the results seem to be good. But you're talking about um, a, a billion doses or more. The vaccine has to be transported, I believe, 100 degrees below zero centigrade. Yeah. Uh, it can be done. It, it, don't get me wrong. It can be done. But let's not underestimate the logistics of getting this out there, first to the people who need it most, then the broader population, getting it around the world. Um, how long does it last? Not clear. Do you need boosters? Not clear. Uh, and it's a good thing. I'm not. We're all for it. But meanwhile, our caseloads are exploding. Our fatality rates are spiking. Uh, and the answer of public policy, uh, the, the public health policy response is to lock the economy down again. And Joe Biden has been explicit about that. And he has already put together his own coronavirus task force of prominent virologists who say that that's what we have to do. Okay. Uh, lockdowns don't work, by the way. I, I explain why in my, my new book, The New Great Depression. I have a, um, there's, there's four chapters on economics, but there's one chapter on the lockdown, one chapter on COVID itself on the disease. I said to my publisher, I said, I can't, you can't ask me to write a book about the uh, pandemic caused depression without writing about the pandemic. I said, Jim, you're not an immunologist. I said, well, I did go to Johns Hopkins, so that counts for something. But um, uh, I found, uh, it's funny, when I, when I started doing that, I said, well, obviously I have to be extremely careful and rigorous because I'm not a, an immunologist yeah. or a virologist or an epidemiologist. 
Um, but I said, what I'll do is there's a lot of crazy theories, nutty theories, conspiracy theories. I'll discard all of those. I'll stick to peer reviewed scientific papers in the journal, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, and many other fine publications. And uh, there were a number of Australian scholars uh, included in my research as well. Uh, so, so I'll just stick to the, you know, the good science. Um, but it turns out the scientists disagree. Oh, even, yeah. when, even when I said, I'm going to stick to this group, which I did, uh, I can show you scientists who say masks don't work. They're not properly constructed. We don't wear them correctly. It's virtue signaling. It feels good. Look, I go to a store. If the, if the owner requires a mask, I wear a mask. I have a, one that looks better than most of the masks people wear. It's a sort of a fashion mask. But <laughs> but the point is, I'm not going to sit there at the door of the store and argue with the owner. I'll, if I don't want to wear a mask, I won't go inside. So I wear a mask. But um, but they don't work <laughs> is, is sort of the answer. Lockdowns definitely do not do not work. Lockdowns kill more people than they save, query if they save any. And by the way, this is all based on hard evidence, Kerry, because- but, but, uh, You know what, I'm going to interrupt you on that one, Jim. And you know, I, I, just to be a bit of a contrarian here, um, we seem to, in Australia, have been quite good at containing the virus. And I'm not in favor of lockdown. I'm just saying it appears to have worked in Australia. We've locked down our international borders. Poor old Victoria got locked down. We can't travel very much from New South Wales, and there seems to be very few of the coronavirus in Australia. It's okay, are you America, gonna... where it seems to be out of control. I'd just like your view on that. And before, and I don't want to spend too long on that because we're running out of time. I right. want to go into how can investors prepare after that, but I'd love your views on Australia versus the US. Well, are you going to, um, first of all, Australia is an interesting place. It is an island. It's a big island, but it is uh, it is an island continent. Uh, and candidly, Kerry, um, I think about 90% of the population are in about six cities, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, you're about right. And, yep. and the cities are kind of widely separated. It's a long flight from Sydney to Brisbane and uh, you know, at least an hour from Sydney to Melbourne. So, uh, and most of the rest of the country is, uh, is desert and, um, and outback. Uh, I've been there <laughs> in jungle. Well, you get up to Darwin, you got some jungle. Uh, no, I've been I've been all over Australia. So, uh, and every and the the place people point to is New Zealand. It's like great New Zealand. Uh, last time I looked at a map, it's two islands where nobody lives, almost no one. And the the thing about an island, by the way, Hawaii had a very good experience for the same reason. If you have an island, you can control. You can only get in by boat or plane, pretty much, and you can close the harbors and close the airports, and and you can do that. Um, so an extreme form of lockdown, but in the United States, it would take martial law uh, to do what you're talking about. Um, my friends in Melbourne, they're not, they, they hear what you're hearing, Kerry, but they're not, they've been through a, a tough time, put it that way. Um, but, here, but more to the point, what are you going to do? Stay locked down for the next 20 years? You're going to, you're going to undo your lockdown at some point. You know what's going to happen? You're I certainly get, hope so. Well, uh, well, and when it happens, you're going to get a spike in cases. In other words, the best the lockdown can do, it's a time shifting thing. It does not reduce the total cases. It does not reduce the total fatalities. It can temporarily reduce the spread at enormous cost. But the minute you try to reopen, the spread comes back again. That's exactly what happened in the United States. And by the way, we have data. Here's the thing, Carrie. We have data from 35 or more countries around the world that all did it differently. Sweden, Japan, Australia, the United States. And in the United States, because of our federal system, we have 50 different states. We had extreme lockdowns in New York. Uh, the governor of South Dakota had no lockdown. Uh, she just wow. said, you know, come, come see it, come. Okay, so we have, the point is, across the spectrum of lockdowns, from no lockdowns to extreme lockdowns and everything in between, the uh, experience is identical. Uh, the the caseload and the fatalities are the same, which means that lockdowns don't work. You they, you can try them, you can do them, you can destroy your economy, but you're not going to change. The, a virus doesn't care uh, about your politics. A virus doesn't care about your economics. A virus just wants to kill you. Uh, that's all they know. And so um, you can't. Again, if you could have. By the way, I, I, when I wrote my book, there were, this will be the first book on the virus and the economy. There are a couple other specialty books on it. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to, to have it. I really urge right. everybody to go and buy it. I'm waiting for mine, Jim. But right. what I want to know is this. If you're right, 
about the lingering effects of the coronavirus, if you're right about a continuing Great Depression, as your book right. title suggests, Correct. what we want to know, everyone that's listening on this virtual gold conference, and we are talking precious metals as well, how can investors prepare if this new Great Depression is here to stay? And in fact, how can they even potentially make money if that's what we're headed towards? Okay, so let me just just connect one dot uh, before yep. I answer that between lockdowns and the economy, because that you really want to talk about the economy, and so do I. Uh, lockdowns destroy the economy for no gain. Okay, you want to debate the gain, that's fine, but but yep. they do destroy economies. I don't think there's any debate about that. Wash your hands, social distancing, let's throw in masks. You'll get 90% of the benefit at 10% of the cost. It's that last 10% where you destroy your economy to save a few K. By the way, you know what lockdowns do? Suicides, drug abuse, alcohol oh, abuse, 100%. domestic abuse, anxiety, depression, people not getting treated for other things. More people are dying because of lockdown than are being saved. Okay, done. Now, but lockdowns cause recessions. That, that's easy. That, that linkage is one-to-one. -one. So because of the new lockdown in the United States, the U.S. will go into a recession in the first quarter. It'll be back-to-back -back recession. We did have that in 1980, uh, 1980 1981. Uh, we had two back-to-back -back recessions separated by a year. This will be separated by about six months. So deflation is the problem. Um, uh, you know, we, we're nowhere near, two, we're not going to get to 2019 levels of output for you. So what can investors do? Uh, I said earlier that um, monetary policy doesn't work because of velocity and that fiscal policy doesn't work because the debt to GDP ratio is too high. And I said there was one thing that does work, but I didn't tell you what it was, but I will now for, for you and, and the audience. Um, deflation is the problem. We have disinflation now, we're going into deflation. Deflation is the problem. You have to break the back of deflation. You have to cause inflation. I know inflation is a naughty word. Uh, among uh, gold investors, but actually that's the, that's the best way to get the price of gold to go up a lot. It's going up anyway. Um, how do you get inflation, especially when you need it, when you're suffering from deflation, which is bad in its own way? You have to change the psychology and the, it's been done twice. It was done in 1933 by President Roosevelt and it was done in 1971 by President Nixon. Mm. And both times they devalued the dollar against gold which means you increase the dollar price of gold. Everyone's like, oh, gold's going up, gold's going up. And I say, no, yeah, it is in dollar terms that it is. But what you're missing is that the dollar is going down. People come to me and say, Jim, you've been predicting for years the dollar is going to collapse. When's it going to happen? I said, it already did happen. What do you think happened between December 16, 2015 and August 2020 when the price of gold doubled from $1,000 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce in round numbers of 10, 1051 to uh, 2019, right? But yeah. call it 1,000 to 2,000. When the price of gold doubles, the value of the dollar is cut in half measured in gold, the dollar already collapsed, but everyone's looking in the wrong place. They're looking at the Euro, the Aussie dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, whatever. These are all passengers in a lifeboat, okay? Yeah, current cross rates go like this. And if you're a day trader or you're an importer, exporter, you care, but they, they don't, you're all in the same lifeboat. Some are taller, some are shorter, some are smarter, some not so much, but they're all gonna sink or swim together. Uh, and that's what currencies do. There's only there's one and only one form of money, which is not in the lifeboat, which is an objective measure, a yardstick independent of central bank policy, and that's gold. And you've got to devalue the dollar against gold, which means increasing the dollar price of gold to break the psychology. And the, the reason you're doing this, of course, gold investors would love it, but that's not why a central bank would do it. They would do it to change the psychology and increase the price of everything else. Franklin Roosevelt did it in 1933. He increased the price of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. And he didn't do it to reward gold holders. In fact, he confiscated all the gold first. So it was the ultimate inside trade, insider trade. But what happened when the price of gold went up, guess what else happened? Oil, wheat, corn, steel, land, everything else went up and people could pay their debts and the economy got going. And we had a boom in the middle of the Great Depression, we screwed it up again in 1937, thanks to the Federal Reserve. That was, that was when the, the dollar was linked to gold. And then in 1971, Nixon took the, the dollar off the well, gold. And so isn't there now a massive disconnect? And although we say gold is money, who cares? We'll just keep printing the funny stuff, the fiat. Well, 
Right. Well, first of all, when you say the dollar was linked to gold, one minute it was twenty dollars, the next minute it was thirty-five dollars. So, so much for your link. In other words, yeah, we were on we were on a gold standard, but he broke the link. That's the point. Nixon ended it once and for all. FDR did it on purpose. Nixon did it by accident, but the result was the same. From nineteen seventy-seven to nineteen eighty-one, the we had fifty percent inflation, five zero. The value of the dollar was cut in half. Gold went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce, mm -hmm. which was a 2,700% gain measured in dollars. That's, and, and by the way, the price of everything up else went up, you know, again, oil, uh, real estate, et cetera. So the, the only way, the only way to break inflation and get inflation is to increase the dollar price of gold. And there's no reason the Federal Reserve can't do it. They're not going to, by the way. We're, we're going to have years. I'm, I'm giving you the solution. I say the same thing to people in Washington. They don't listen, but I'm happy to share. Um, I'm giving you the answer, yep. which is you've got to increase the dollar price of gold to get the inflation and everything else to get out of the deflationary rut. You have to do it. And by the way, it solves the debt problem because mm. the, the, the debt, debt is nominal. I'm a big fan of real, real numbers, but debt is a nominal thing. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. It's interesting whether it's actually worth 95 cents or a dollar 10 because of deflation or inflation, but I owe you a buck. That's the contract. Well, if you have inflation, guess what happens to the real value of the debt? It goes down. If you have deflation, what happens to the real value of the debt? It goes up, you go broke. So you need the inflation to solve the debt problem, break the back of deflation, get the nominal economy moving, solve all these problems at once, but they don't, understand it. The Fed forgot how. I, but I do explain it in my book uh, in chapter six and in uh, the conclusion where I, I go through this in a lot of detail. Um, for example, the Federal Reserve, the board could go in the room, close the door, take a vote, walk outside. Jay Powell could walk up to the microphone and say, ladies and gentlemen, as of now, the price of gold is $5,000 an ounce. And if you think that's cheap, come and get it. Fort Knox, the door's open. You can buy all the gold you want. And if you think it's rich, we'll buy it from you because we got the printing press. So you use the gold in Fort Knox and the printing press and your buyer at 49.95 and your seller at 50.50. If, if you do that, the price of gold is $5,000 an ounce. It's an open market operation. How do you think they control interest rates? They buy and sell bonds. Mm -hmm. If you want to control the price of gold, buy and sell gold. And by the way, don't worry about the amount of gold in Fort Knox because there's 10 times as much on the open market in private hands. It may not be, everyone's like, ah, oh, the gold mining output only increases 1.6% a year. Well, that's true, but it's irrelevant because there's 150,000 tons of private gold. You can print money and buy that gold all day. And it's just another open market operation. So it can be done. It has been done, but it won't be done soon. So what better opportunity is there for investors to buy gold today? You're front, you're front running the central banks. They're going to get there. It's just going to take them a while, but you can front run the central banks and make huge profits. So again, um, for those of you that, that, that are listening in the past, you have said, you just talked about $5,000 gold, but you've, you've been quoted as saying gold will get to $15,000 and above sometimes you said, and we're Correct. talking US dollars per ounce. Right. Um, right now it's about 1850, you know, give and take a little bit. Um, that's and and people have actually said to you in the past, Jim. That's crazy. Yes, at some point it will get to fifteen thousand, but perhaps not in my lifetime. Well, why uh, have, do you say that? Why do you, why do you say that it is going to have this run? Okay, well, there's a technical analysis and a, and a fundamental analysis, and they're both in the book. Um, but uh, have I? Uh, let me ask you a question, Carrie. Have I done a good job of keeping my math at the sixth grade level or, or lower? <laughs> Loving it because okay. I am a sixth grade mathematics person. Correct. I am not okay. university educated. And, I, and I think it's, by the I, way, it, Jim, I think it's really important that we do, and you know, I call it the KISS method, method, keep it simple, stupid, because you don't want to overwhelm people. You just want to give them, here's the base case scenario, plus by okay. Oh, okay, so so with that in mind, if gold is uh, $2,000 an ounce, and it goes to $3,000 an ounce, what's the percentage increase? 50%. 50%. It's 50%. Yeah. Because well, a thousand, okay. So if gold goes from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce, that's a 50% gain. But if gold is $14,000 an ounce and it goes to $15,000 an ounce, that's a 7.1% gain. Yeah. No, it's still a thousand bucks, right? It's it's real money. It's a thousand bucks to you, the, the, the owner cool. or the holder. 
But as you get to higher levels, the percentage increase drops yes. because yes. you're working off a larger denominator. Yep. So everyone's like $15,000. What they don't understand is the last $5,000 will go happen in the blink of an eye because it's, it's to go from 14 to 15, that's a 7% gain. That's one week's worth of volatility. Yes. You're going to start to see $100 days routinely. You almost do today. You're going to start to see $1,000 a month routinely because at each level, the thousand, but same thousand bucks, you still get the money, but the thousand bucks is a smaller percentage of the then existing base. So you're going to go from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 to 14, just like that, maybe a year or less. Uh, now it's, it's, those are bigger gains today. A thousand dollars today is a 50% increase, but then when you get to 3000, another thousand dollar gain is only a 33% increase yeah, exactly. at yeah. that point. It's only a 25, et cetera, until it gets, until it, be, it becomes trivial. Uh, or at least small relative to daily volatility. So, so get your gold now before that before that happens. Because if you're waiting for the, well, I'm going to wait till it gets to eight thousand dollars and nine thousand dollars, you're going to miss out. First of all, you will have missed out on the on the early gains, but you you're in danger of missing out on the late gains because because it, it's sort of like the hockey stick that a lot of the gains in these bull markets happen at the end. All the more reason to get in at the early stage because you need less money to do it. What would you say to people out there that say, uh, well, Jim, that's all well and good, but right now <clears throat> the funny money is not just going to go into gold. We've also got all this digital and the world is going digital. Whether we like it or not, governments are going digital. Every, everything's going digital. Well, what would you say to those people that say, well, actually uh, Bitcoin and some of the cryptocurrencies are going to suck in some of the money that would normally go into potentially a gold market. Does that affect uh, it, that it anyway, or it's irrelevant? Yeah, well, it's it's sort of a sideshow. I mean, the market cap of Bitcoin, it's getting, I guess it's getting back to the $20,000 level or, or close to it, uh, which, pardon, which was the all time high in uh, January, early January, 2018. Um, there has been zero net wealth creation as the result of Bitcoin. What you have are wealth transfers. So basically, I have, I have friends, good friends who they bought their Bitcoin at well below $1,000 an ounce. It went to 20. They sold it kind of at the 18, 19 level, paid their taxes, and they're extremely wealthy. They've been traveling around the world ever since. Uh, those people are real. They're out there. There are, there are Bitcoin billionaires. But what about the South Korean garage owner who hocked his inventory to buy Bitcoin at $17,000 an ounce, saw it wiped out, and committed suicide? Mm. In other words, what's happened? What happens with Bitcoin? There's no. It's not like like Microsoft. Like Bill Gates is worth whatever, hundred billion dollars, probably more. Um, but he created value. He created more value. He got his share, but he created far more value than he took uh, for the rest of us because we get to use all this software uh, and it's added to productivity, et cetera. So I don't care if people are worth hundred billion if they created, you yeah. know, a hundred times more. But Bitcoin, there's no wealth creation. No, if people got rich, they took it from other people. So yeah. if if that if that if that lets you rest easy and sleep at night, you know, fine. I'm not one of them. But uh, but there's no value added in Bitcoin. Is the answer. But crypto is different um, uh, because we're we're seeing the rise of crypto central bank currencies. Uh, and you can see, I said this years ago, and you can, you can see it coming. The, the central banks, just, they didn't understand cryptocurrencies, if those joke, et cetera. But you have to distinguish between the blockchain, which is the technology, and the token, which could be Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or any of the others. But now, pretty soon, the, the token is going to be the euro, the Aussie dollar, the US dollar, et cetera. Blockchain is just, it's just a ledger. Absolutely. I mean, you think of, think of Bob Cratchit and uh, Charles Dickens, you know, he was sitting there writing the ledger by hand. This is just a digitized ledger, which is different in the sense that the entire history of all the Bitcoin trans, or I'll, I'll say Bitcoin, but whatever ledger it is, Bitcoin, Euro, whatever, the entire history of all the transactions is carried forward into the next transaction and the one after that and the one after that. That's why they call it the block chain because it's always a block and it has a chain of all the transactions back to day one. That's a lot of writing for, for Bob Cratchit, but it's not too much for a computer. Uh, and the message traffic is encrypted. So it's a cryptocurrency. So you have, you have the anonymity. So it's a good ledger system and it's not limited to, to money. Um, could be a property title, uh, stocks, bonds, uh, 
um, bills of lading, it's used in trade networks, et cetera. It has a lot of good uses. By the way, it's been around since the eighties, nothing really new about it. Um, so it's been Jim, linked to- Jim, conference. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are running out of time. I, uh, my next speech- Time flies. Week. I know, I know, you know, I should have had you on for two hours. It's only, <laughs> a, a, uh, and we did start a fraction early. So um, what I'd like to do is, I would love to hear your final views. We've got nearly a thousand people listening to you today. There'll be a lot mm -hmm. more that, li that listen post uh, today's conference. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those people that have come onto this virtual gold conference to listen to Jim Ricards and what his views are on how they can protect and grow their wealth? Three things that you would do in this current crazy world, apart from the first two are <laughs> go buy currency wars and then go buy the new Great Depression. What's well, the third one? Well, buy, yeah, buy the, do buy the new Great Depression because everything we talked about is in that book with, with a lot more detail and a lot of end notes. So, uh, so that's good. So I would say uh, be prepared for slow growth at best and a recession highly likely in early 2021, a back-to-back -back recession, that's going, to be, that's going to be a major headwind for stocks. Um, and so number one, I'd kind of lighten up on equity, not zero, but you know, I'd lighten up. I would increase my allocations to cash because uh, it, ha it has a low yield, yes. But first of all, it's a great asset in deflation, which we may experience. But cash has, first of all, it reduces the volatility. Cash is the opposite of leverage. Leverage increases the volatility of your portfolio. But if you have stocks and gold and other volatile assets, a slug of cash in the middle will reduce the volatility, help you sleep at night. But cash has enormous embedded optionality. There's so much uncertainty in the world. Uh, I, can, I do forecasting, you know, kind of for a living and we can see some of these things, but I'll be the first to admit there's a lot of uncertainty. So you might pivot in the direction of deflation, all of a sudden, boom, here's the inflation. Okay, so, but the person with cash can pivot back. The person who's gone all in on certain assets, you know, try getting your money back from Henry Kravis, you know, ahead of schedule. You can't. So, so have some cash. Don't lock in. Uh, give yourself that optionality. And third, by all means, have a significant allocation of hard assets, gold first and foremost, uh, but property will do well. By the way, not commercial real estate in cities. That's going to do horribly. And I'm on, I, I know a lot of people in the commercial real estate business. I'm on some boards. It's going to do horribly. But residential real estate in, you know, including multifamily housing developments in suburbs, people, uh, I'm not sh quite sure what's going on in Australia, but in the United States, we have an exodus from the city. Cities are the greatest. Pretty much the same here, Jim. Yeah. Cities are the greatest wealth creation mechanisms in the history of civilization. And if we're depopulating our cities, we're destroying our wealth engine, but it's very good for suburban real estate developers because people are just moving out. They're fed up with everything we see. So I would say um, d diversification, real you know, people, they buy 30 stocks and they go, I'm diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You're in one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, I have some stocks, some bonds, you know, high quality government notes, gold, cash, uh, alternatives, real estate. That's real diversification, number one. Have a big slug of cash, give yourself some optionality and by all means have some gold. Jim Rickards, author, commentator, all around good guy, as usual, fantastic to chat with you today. Thank you for opening up our virtual gold conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Mr. Jim Rickards a virtual congratulations. Thank you. You're awesome. And go out there and buy his book. It's on Amazon, Booktopia. It's on all the good books. As Molly Meldrum would say, do yourself a favor, go buy his book. Talk to you soon. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you.